Hey SEOs and content marketers, say goodbye to crazy spreadsheet mashups and experience unprecedented connectivity between your SEO planning and reporting data. Introducing Audios Key, technology for keyword mapping, content brief automation, and rank tracking that form an SEO strategy system providing unparalleled feedback loops between planning, reporting, and optimization activities. Put your time and energy into strategy, not data upkeep. Visit audiencekey.com and apply for a free trial today. FM. This week, presented in part from the Collision 2024 conference at the at Exhibition uh, Place in downtown Toronto. This is Jim Hedger from Digital Always Media and Christine Schackinger from Sites Without Walls. Hey, everybody. And it has been an incredibly busy week in uh, in, in search. And uh, actually, well, in, in, in my own personal life, I was, have spent the last couple of days at um, one of the largest tech conferences I've I, I've been at probably the third largest tech conference I've ever been at um third only to um a web summit and last and the collision conference in 2022 also at exhibition place in downtown Toronto collision is enormous it is a mashup of very big money all of the very big tech houses google and meta and bing yahoo uh perplexity uh, uh, uh x.com etc every every big house is there apple um microsoft but it's not just the big money and the big tech houses it's also every young entrepreneur and creator, designer, um, young people with great passion and great desire, and often wonderful, um, potentially world-changing ideas. And these three forces, the force of, you know, grassroots good, the big tech houses, I mean, the 800-pound gorillas, and big money big big money like like nation state or bank sized invest um mega capital money all combine in a space the size of three five six airplane hangers honest to goodness it's hard to tell how big the place is after the first two airplane hangers um eight major stages an array of topics from biomedicine to artificial intelligence to everything to do fintech uh, just across the board anything you could possibly think of in the in the tech world is represented at at, at collision in one way or another uh, dozens of nation states and one fact this was a smaller show than than previously and unfortunately it was the last collision show in toronto but a pro, uh, 37,832 attendees from 117 countries 1834 companies on the uh, on the event floor uh, again startups from 57 countries 45 percent of exhibits uh were women founded 42 of the 42 percent of attendees are women 35 percent of the speakers were women interestingly 1003 members of the media 570 speakers and uh 300 739 investors i was inc incidentally one of the 1003 media persons and the collision conference treated us amazing incredible access brilliantly helpful staff and uh well making access <laughs> as uh easy as possible in an environment that is by nature completely overwhelming we got an interview with one of the most more innovative people in the uh, in the world of search richard Socher, the uh, ceo of u.com that's going to be coming up at the tail end of the of the show um i'm i had a great deal of fun talking to richard he was a wonderful person to meet and incredibly gracious to give uh to give us 20 minutes of his time um christine 
you've been to uh, huge shows. You know, you, you live in Las Vegas, um, the home of the home of CES, which is one of the hugest of the huge shows. But have, have you ever been to a web summit? An I internet summit, one of one of these shows? No, I have not been to one. Sounds like it'd be fascinating to go to. Intellectually fascinating, absolutely. The speakers, the speaker lineup is incredible. It's um, there's there's no end of interesting things to talk about, interesting people to talk to, or uh, uh, university level lectures to go to. But again, um, it's like CES. The size of CES is just completely overwhelming. You're, you're never going to see it all. There's, it's, it's hopeless to, to even think to try. But you still walk away with a sense of awe, inspiration, sometimes a little bit of terror. Very true. And I have walked 20,000 steps in six hours at a CES one day and only covered about 10% of the entire conference. Yeah. So yeah. the cool thing about the Web Summit series, which which Collision is a part of, um, Patty Cosgrove uh, was is, is the organizer. Their major show is in Lisbon every year. Next year, they're going to be moving Web Summit North America to Vancouver. And if anybody can get to it, I 100% recommend it um, as an attendee, as a speaker, as a sponsor, or um, as, a, as a media person. Um, the Web Summit people put on a great show. They have amazing speakers. The only thing I can say that's a drawback if you're heavily involved in the tech industry, like, most, like, like you and I, or most of the people I think listening to the show, Going to a conference like this is like you're definitely going and listening to a university level lecture, but it's a survey lecture. There's no time to really get deep into the specifics in and, and and you know, so you're going you're 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 listening to AI three oh one, but you don't get all the really cool stuff that you would get in the in the specific classes, hey? Eh? You're just getting this wonderful uh brain challenging overview. Anyway. That was my collision experience. It was it was huge, terrifying, wonderful, and um, overwhelming, but way worth the way worth the experience. So, what you've been up to all week? <laughs> um, vertigo. <laughs> I've had vertigo all week. I haven't done a whole lot, so I uh, did did work. You know. Um, and yeah, it did work. That's about it. <laughs> Nothing exciting like we did. Well, you know, at um, the conferences are exciting. They're, they're always exciting, and then seeing seeing new things and meeting new people is exciting. But they're also exhausting. The they other are. drawback to this collision is Toronto is currently broken. Um, it's just there's no way, no other way to phrase it. The key transportation route to the venue, which is 15 minutes away from everything. So the venue itself, Exhibition Place, is 15 minutes away from downtown. It's in a part of the city that's traditionally been hard to get to until they built this new dedicated dedicated train route to it that was broken this week. Oh, Shuttle buses good. provided for people's convenience were really inconvenienced because Toronto's also under a heat dome right now so being outside is like walking into a sauna so imagine people dressed for a conference squished together in a bus after standing outside waiting for said bus and then hitting uh mega city traffic which is which is hella bad yeah not fun horrible really vegas has been cooler than normal this week the only one well you know what any experience would have been cooler than this. <laughs> no, it was 69 degrees when I woke up the other morning oh. in Vegas in June. That's never heard of. Oh my God. You've had your heat dome. We got it now. Yeah, you can have it back it. if you want it. You said it east and north. <laughs> okay. So we got, you know what? We got a, we got a great interview with Richard Socher, uh, CEO of U.com, coming up in a few minutes uh, towards the end of the show. But before we get there, stuff happened this week. Stuff's actually happening right now. Uh, this morning, Google announced that uh, the um, June 2024 spam update has dropped. You know, I really miss when we had creative fun names for these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The spam Hormel update. update. June 24. Yeah, this is <laughs> the, the Hormel update. update. The fried like Hormel that. update. 
Call it the Hormel update. Something fun. <laughs> it used to be that uh, Google updates, Google algorithm updates, and all that stuff for, had had specific names. We and then you know, long time listeners have heard about the Florida update uh, over and over and over again, or Hilltop, or Caffeine, or Caffeine, or Penguin, or Panda, or Pigeon. They were so much more fun. Well, they were a lot of fun, and you, you know what? People are still welcome to name these updates anything they want. I call them all Fred personally. Um, actually, <laughs> I call them all the Danny Sullivan update because Danny's the one who announced. I don't know if he did it personally, but he's the one who announced that Google was putting the kibosh on creatively naming updates, probably because Google's telling us about a lot more updates and creative names are kind of getting, you know, hard to keep track of. So we know for sure that a spam update happened in June 2024 because Google said this is the June 2024 spam update, yeah. colloquially known as Fred, sometimes known as Danny Sullivan. <laughs> Hormel. I like Hormel. <laughs> the thing is, you can only use Hormel once. And then, yeah, you know, it's variations of Hormels. You know, fried Hormel, boiled Hormel, raw Hormel, Hormel with cheese, Ooh. you know. Pineapple. Hormel with pineapple. <laughs> hey, most people, most people would just think that's irregular. <laughs> no, that's on pizza. Well, no, no, that's, you need glue. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Glue is what holds the cheese on. It's yeah, toothpicks that holds the pineapples on. There should never be pineapple on a pizza. I'm from New York originally. It's, it's, it's just a thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm from but Canada where we have long winters. And um, pineapple is, and ham on a pizza is Hawaiian pizza, and that makes us think it's tropical when it's negative 30 outside. So, you know, we'll wrong. take your screwed up perception for our perception <laughs> of warmth any day of the week. <laughs> okay, so spam update is going on. I don't know if you all remember what happened the last time a spam update rolled out, but Google said it eliminated 45% of spam content on the on the web. Or at least in its index. No, they never said 45% of what? Well, that's 45%. the thing. That's I mean, yeah, 45% of <laughs> spam avoid. content in its web. So that meant Unhelpful that content. at least 55% was left. Huh? And um, um, what is, and again, yeah, this, it's like it's like 50% off, right? Of what? Yeah, of what? I don't know. It's 45%. I don't know. <laughs> well, Just to remind people, automatically generating content solely to improve search rankings. This includes AI. Um, buying or selling links to manipulate rankings, then a duplicated or poor quality content or tricking users with cloaking like hidden redirects are considered spam features. Also, if you have affiliates, um, something moved into the spam category is if you do not label your affiliate or ad links with a rel sponsored or a rel no follow, or there's one other, I can't think of, a paid. What's the other one? Sponsored, no follow, there's one of those. I'm um, sorry, I don't know. I don't know either. But uh, if you don't label those, they actually can uh, classify you as spam. And I found on the last updates that 45% of the people that answered my little survey did not know, did not put that on there. So just be, keep that in mind if you're running affiliates or ads. And other thing too, I saw a site that was here with a manual action spam, reviewed it for them. And they used, did not know that the writers were using AI content. I read it so much, I was able to tell that it was probably AI content, and it was. Um, it was thin, but not thin in the sense that there wasn't words on the page. Thin in the sense there was no depth or breadth to what they wrote about. So they, let's say they're writing about like your conference. It'd be like, I attended Collision Conference. It was great. That was it. It happened at the exhibition. Yes, yeah. it was big. Indeed. And there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's no color. There's no experience. And no more, moreover, there's no emotion in a lot of this writing. And also, this one, the one I'm talking about was actually a technical site, but the, they didn't get into any depth in the topics. As like, you need this, they call like, they're talking about the hackers at one point. You know, like, hackers are these kind of guys. Okay, now you see, that's okay. a sentence you want to make scary. There's emotion. Yeah, exactly. I've been doing this for but, 20 years, Christine, and I, I like to think I write, I write, I write writer. poetry into my technical work. I like to you think do, You do, you do amazing. I always tell people about the bag story, Jim. I was looking for a client of mine and had to write about plastic bags. I'm like, how is he going to make this interesting? And yet he did. But I, I just be careful that if you have used AI, that um, that the AI doesn't tend to do depth or breadth. So if you get hit with the spam, check and make sure that your content has depth to it, has meat to it, meat on the bone. 
you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to do this, Christine, but I have to use this as a segue. I don't really remember writing that plastic bag content, and I really wish I did. But oh, I have it. Oh, I'm you so do. Lucky. Okay, so I see, do. I store everything. Yeah, that's wonderful because. If it wasn't for you, I might be tempted to use a product that Microsoft was going to introduce, but decided to drop. Mike, remember, remember, we talked about this a couple, Microsoft Total Recall, um, the AI yeah. tool that was going to take a picture of what you're up to every few minutes and then store it somewhere. Or, that people can we just get call to. it the what were you thinking tool? What were you, what thinking? you thinking? What were you looking what at? What were you doing? You were looking at what? Oh, wow. Tool. They were thinking, oh, lots of stuff to trade on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then they went, oh, let's store it in the most insecure format possible. And let's serve some of it from the edge so people can get to it through the internet. I.e., um, not a good idea for users to find their stuff hacked and used by hackers online. So they have not, they have not rolled it out. Um, you can get it through their special program. Um, they have access to the... What's you get the name of the special program, Windows Insiders program. Microsoft but Corporate Vice it. President for Windows and Devices, uh, Pavan uh, Davuluri, wrote, we are adjusting the release model for Recall to leverage the expertise of the Windows Insider community to ensure the experience meets our high standard for quality and security. I think that's probably because most of the people in the Windows Insider community were like, don't do this! Well, they were like, what do you, what do you mean? Testing for security? You had no security. There's literally zero security on this. So you'd sit there all day and it would take pictures of everything from your banking to yep. your private messages, to your emails, to your company's proprietary information. And then it just stored it in the wide open internet, basically. I mean, it wasn't the wide open internet, it was your computer, but they could still access it from the internet. So uh, with no security on it whatsoever, which, what were they thinking? That's well, they, thinking. they weren't. Um, well, they, were, they, were, they were thinking that they were gonna make uh things much more convenient for people like myself who can't remember to remember stuff um or they were going to get a whole bulk of stuff then that the, that the well-written end user license agreement allows them to train ai on who knows but they're not going to do it anymore but keep an eye on this this is one of those ideas that they say they're not doing now but you don't know if it's actually gone away or it's just going to be repurposed to something else so keep watching yes um, it's not that I don't trust Microsoft, by the way. It's just that I don't necessarily trust Microsoft, by the way. Well, that was just, I mean, seriously, <laughs> leaving it in, in the clear text, like, that's just crazy. Like, Microsoft knows better than that. They're not a startup. They know. Speaking of trust, um, the web is built on paper clips, bailing wire, handshake, and trust. It always has been always will be and we're breaking that trust badly and here's another example um uh, the perplexity ai <laughs> ironically being sued by forbes for yeah. um copyright infringement um and here's the diff right. well forbes put in its robot text that perplexity said they would respect don't come here and perplexity said, <laughs> blew through the robot's tax and like like it was a restraining order and just went there anyway. Yeah, and uh, Condé Nast reported 822 times in the past three months that it see, saw the secret IP address. And they say they don't keep, um, that's only a fraction of their server logs. So it could be thousands more times than that. They're, they're blocking. Okay, and, so yeah, uh, apparently, Perplexity is using an unpublicized IP address to get around blockers, uh, the people who are blocking its crawler. And Condé Nast published the IP address, eh? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's. I think there's more than one. That's well, there has to be. There's no way they're yeah. only using one. No, one that was hitting them. And um, we can't say the exact name of the article, but it's Perplexity is a bovine species machine. Yeah, uh, a, B, a perplexity yeah. is a BS machine. It's in Wired magazine. Yeah. Um, there is. So look it up uh, in Bing because it's not coming up in Google for some reason. So you have to look it up in Bing. Yeah, for what it's worth, if you're interested in um, in this in in the story, uh, on June 18th, um, Axios published it. Uh, Sarah Fisher under the headline "Scoop: Forbes Threatens Perplexity with Legal Action." So if you can't find it at Wired, you can find it at Axios. Um, and the the deal is. 
Perplexity said it would respect a robot's tech saying, don't come here. Um, they clearly didn't. Now, that said, there's a bunch of ways you can get content. When something gets published on Forbes, it doesn't necessarily stay on Forbes. So even if Forbes blocks um, Perplexity from coming to that content, it can go get a non-canonical version of the of the of said same content. The trick here, though, is the owner of Forbes, uh, Condé Nast Publishers, found Perplexity's IP address yes. hitting their server even after we've been instructed not to hit it. So that's 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 the deal here. Even then, that they can get the 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 the, the, the content. Condé Nast might have a problem with content piracy, but that's not perplexity per, perplexity AI's fault. They're just exploiting it. But this is no, different. And they have the they have the receipts too. And they obviously hired people or had people internally who could trace this, so they do know for a fact that perplexity was sending these bots to their site. So here's the thing. The robots. Just because Condé Nast and uh, and Forbes is suing Perplexity, it doesn't actually mean that anything's going to change. Um, it could go to court, and the judge doesn't understand the complexity of the issue, which is you know very likely um, in, in in this world, given how complex the issues are. Um, or the judge could could see nothing wrong with Perplexity's Perplexity's actions. Who knows? Um. But we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, and of course, it has all the issues of a regular large language model, which is it also publishes a lot of things that are just not real. I just make it up. Well, so, indeed, but that's not that's not the what this this is about specifically. Oh, um, it's, it's part of it's part of it. It's part of it because they said some things that were untrue. So, um, related to what Forbes had published. So, but either way, yes, it's uh, it's not a good look for perplexity. Especially because they're in a funding round, I believe, right now. <laughs> so you live in an AI Uber Alice world, whether you like it or not. And actually, um, we're going to be talking a lot about um, AI in search results and generative search results with Richard Socher in, in, in a few minutes. Um, and Richard's going to make a great case for generative search results. But he's also going to make a good case for... 10 blue links and the importance of 10 blue links. Google, on the other hand, the, um, well, the people who use 10 blue links to propel themselves into the, you know, mega status, um, is how does AI overviews, they are not letting you, they won't allow you to turn it off. Um, in uh, Google's uh, FAQ documents, recently published uh, AI overview FAQ documents, they, have a, uh, a a paragraph on why they won't let you turn it off. Um, basically, it comes down to Google's goals to help people find the information they're looking for quickly and reliably. Yeah, otherwise, we know better than you what you want, so we will not allow you to turn it off. Yeah. Can't now, close it either. You still have the right to scroll downwards and find the information below the fold, which as every SEO knows is effectively somewhere in the swamp or under the swamp or under the ground that's the base of the swamp, somewhere down there. So while it's generating, you have time to just quickly roll past it. So it's not big yet. It's just tiny. That's okay. the idea. As it loads in, it takes a while to load in, so I just quickly scroll past it. And you can also use uh, the web links button. In Google search. I got I got I got to say straight up one of the things that came out of uh, collision for me is AI in search is not going away ever anytime soon or probably ever. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I should say that the big houses don't plan to remove it. What the users do and how how that affects user experience in the long run that's another thing. But their plans yeah. currently are to double down and introduce more of it. The interesting thing is, um, in the field itself, uh, I, I'm interested to see what happens. I don't have an answer to this, but there's going to be a uh, divide at some point in the near future, which is a lot of the academics and researchers and researchers in big companies aren't really loving large language models. They kind of want to move away from them. And funding has gone down quite a bit this year. 
So we'll see what happens in the next year because I know the big companies like Microsoft and Google and they've sunk a lot of money into it. But what happens when the other part of the industry is like, nah, we don't care. We're moved on. And this, this is another happen. thing that, that I don't think you've touched on yet, yet, Christine, but it's a real, real concern and you can't, you can't dodge around it. And that's called revenue model. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't make money for what they cost. Oh, well, indeed. And, and you can have um, really cool toys and baubles and, but if it isn't making money, it's not going to um, last. Yeah, that's pure, that's, billion... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, there's, no, there's just no way around that. So it's a hard wall. They spent the industry spent fifty billion on chips last year and made three billion. And then when they say like OpenAI, I think recently was supposed to be one point five billion or something. If you look how much they've invested in it, it's so much larger than what they're getting on the return. Also, the research I follow a lot of the major researchers and academics and big people and companies on LinkedIn. And the main discussion in the last two to three weeks has been, and this is very recent, is uh, basically they don't scale, they don't lead to AGI, which is one of the big reasons they were so for them. Um, they cost too much, they can't be fixed, and um, they use too much energy. So, uh, so they and they take they, there's too much. They need they require too much training because they're almost they'll be out of anything to train on in the next I believe it's eight years, six years, six to eight years. Well, just to, just to touch yeah. on um, what you were saying about the amount of money that's been invested just in the hardware end of AI alone. Yeah. You know who the most capitalized, the, the, the company with the biggest market cap in the world is today? Yep. You want to go and set it though? I know. NVIDIA. Yep. That happened. NVIDIA. That happened. Well, that was announced last week, I think. They were the only one that made the chip. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> so NVIDIA yeah. is it. NVIDIA is, NVIDIA is um, a boss company on earth right now. Yeah. We'll see how long though. Microsoft and OpenAI already said they're making their own chip, and uh, somebody, I forget if it's OpenAI or wow. Google is moving to Dell. And well, uh, sorry, Also, we'll remember, NVIDIA makes the shovels. NVIDIA, make, NVIDIA makes the city in which the commerce happens, but once the city's built, you don't need NVIDIA. The city's been built. You need them, you exactly. need them for, new, for new stuff. But uh, we, had a, we had a company in, in Canada, uh, uh, JT Uniphase that uh, made fiber optic cables. And for a while, they were one of the largest companies on earth. Just before uh, the year 2K, when we were stringing fiber over to India and over to Eastern Europe, because we needed programmers and we needed like millions of programmers to, to, to keep catastrophe from happening. Um, but then once the fiber was, was strung, JD Uniphase became a non-concern and they are now nowhere. Um, they're now out of business. So it that can happen. So fast these days. It yeah, and by so the way, uh, just back to a point that we made. I'm just back to what we were talking about about AI overviews, and uh, I just want to reiterate: if if you hate all the junk in the search results and you don't want the AI overviews, you can go to a um, it's the little button. What do they call them? The little circle things, filters that says web, and it'll give you just the links, nothing else. Of course, bad part doesn't give you local maps, which is the other thing that I like, but. Um, or top stories. But other than that, I'll give you 10 blue links. So if you don't want to deal with the AI overview, you don't have to. There's well, also there are, a whole bunch of... There are of also it. plugins for Chrome you can get that will... Uh, I was just going to say, there's a whole the... bunch of its plugins too. Yeah. But Google itself doesn't want to make it nope. a make you able to be able to, to turn this off. They say they know better. Okay. Okay. You know what? <laughs> we got about 10, maybe 15 minutes before we got to jump to the interview. So I want to... I want to get a couple more stories in here. This one I think is uh, is important and interesting. Um, it's uh, Google on the concept of uh, uh, Danny Sullivan actually on the on the concept of traffic diversity as a ranking factor. I really wish that they wouldn't make headlines with the reverse negative as the headline. Yeah. Um, but okay, yeah. so Danny responds to a question about whether traffic diversity is a ranking factor. A uh, hint. Nope. Uh, uh, too long did, didn't listen. Part it isn't entirely. It's, it well, isn't. This drives me crazy. Why phrase it this way? Is it, it's clickbait? It, it's not a ranking factor. Um. Anyway, it's, it's, it, I, I hate putting the negative in the title. Yeah, but basically, um, Google says you know if you show that you're for people like your stuff gets shared and you have social, you know, sites yourself and all that stuff. It's it's a positive, but it's not a ranking factor. My guess is there's other things 
that Google might use it for to like, you know, just like when they do spam updates, because spammers don't tend to have social media presence, you know, things like that. You know, what's funny, yeah. like 12 years ago, when when he and I were, were business partners, Alan Kanak wrote a um, a, a, a conference lecture called Social Be uh, Social Campfire, where there's smoke, there's fire, um, or there's smoke, there's flame. On the idea that this isn't a ranking factor, you're not. Google isn't saying, "Oh, hey, look, three social mentions. Let's ramp them up a notch." But it does make Google notice you. Um, yeah, and it can it confirms that you're working for people, not just Google rankings. And and it, and it shows yeah. interaction. It shows that people yeah. dig what you're doing. But that doesn't mean that Google is going to dig what you're doing. It just says to Google, "Hey, look over here," because a lot of other people are looking over here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, yeah. that was 12 years ago, Alan wrote that. 12 years ago. And it's, <laughs> so has it changed? It hasn't. Oh, well, no, it hasn't changed. A lot of the core stuff doesn't change really. I mean, it gets more detailed or more, you know, complex, but it doesn't really change or go away. Okay. Um, so, by the way, I think oh, we could get through a bunch of these if we did like really fast stories. Yeah. So that's the official line. Traffic diversity yeah. is, uh, is will we'll get you looked at, but it will not necessarily get you ranked. Don't go, don't even think that. Yes. Where are we going next? Um, let's go to let's uh, let's say the study at the end for a quick optimistic piece for people. Um, Google Map pin exploit. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> okay, so uh, as it turns out, you can go and you can take your competitor and you can like put him a million miles away from where he yes. really is because you're a jerk. And also, what happens when that happens is. So I take your map pin and I move it. I'm in Las Vegas and I move it to LA and your rankings now go away because your pin is in LA and they're linked to your location. So um, if you notice a sudden complete drop in your local map or rank local rankings, uh, go ahead and uh, make sure someone didn't move your pin. But the problem is when they move your pin, if you try to move it back through the Google interface, um, you could actually get a suspension because when they think happens. you're the because they think you're the hacker. Yeah, which is weird. Cause it's already been moved, right? So, but, um, and they and they don't notify you when this happens. So, so yeah. okay. So how how does this happen, and um, what do you do about it? It's a loophole, and you Google has not fixed it, and it's been around for a while. So who knows if they're going to fix it? Uh, according to Darren Shaw of White Spark, they do have a. Um, for a dollar a month, I'm not promoting it as a tool. I haven't used it. I'm just letting people know it exists. They will notify you if your map has been pulled, your map pin has changed, um, and then you at least know it's it happened, and then they give you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to go outside the Google Map interface to move it. And um, so far, he didn't seem to have seen people get suspended for that, but they do get suspended when they use the actual Google interface. Not everyone, but people do, and it's a risk you take when you move it again. A uh, quick, um, uh, just a quick pro tip. If this does happen to you before doing anything, document and screenshot everything. Obsessively yes. screenshot because you may have to prove your case later. Yeah, and you may just go directly to Google and try to re reclaim it that way before you try to move it or anything like that. Yeah, but again, um, make sure you got things, uh, make sure you got proof on your side. Uh, it may, you may not use it, but it may be useful. Yes. Okay. Uh, Google, uh, common reasons when a spike in crawling is bad. <laughs> Everyone thinks a like, spike in crawling is good. It does not mean it's good. It can mean nothing. It can mean they just, like you moved your site or you migrated or something. It's just checking it again. It can be before there's an update because they, they check, uh, you know, sites before updates. But they will crawl a lot of sites. So if you have like 10 in your, or five or whatever in your Google search console and none of the others have been crawled, then it's definitely not an update coming. And it can be if there's bad things, like, like if your site's been hacked or if uh, Google detects other issues with your site. Server error. Start increasing, yeah, and crawling to see if uh, there's something going on. If, if you see a massive uptake in requests and a lull in, um, in, 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 in the amount downloaded to services requests, you got a 500 issue on your server. Guarantee it. Yes. And also infinite spaces. So I had this happen with a client. They suddenly went down 30% and I couldn't figure out why. And so I ran the crawler and I opened up the, I stopped the crawler because it's crawling forever. It just keeps adding pages. 
And I find out they had it a calendar, which is way deep down in the site that I couldn't, you know, find easily. And it was set to be crawled to create dates. Oh, shoot. Events. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So and it wouldn't stop. I, no, I stopped it in 2072. And so um, be careful about <laughs> infinite space issues because, yeah, because the crawler will just keep crawling and, and then it just eventually, and it will cause you to have downturns. So we fixed it. We got our traffic back, but. So, uh, yeah, to, so to check that out, go to Google Search Console, hit settings, and there's a Google uh, Google crawl. Click Google crawl, and you can see how Google crawl has Google crawler looks at your website, and you can see its pattern. You should see a fairly steady pattern of request and um, blue line is request. Purple line is how much was downloaded to meet the request. They don't have to match each other exactly, but they should sort of mirror each other in their in their spike and drop patterns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, um let's see uh so we this uh, one's important javascript for yeah. structured data i think that's one that one is i think is really important that is i'll let you take this one okay so structured data is really important um it's it's it, it's how you get enhanced enhanced uh search results it's also how you basically feed data about your website to Google, about products in your website to Google. It's it's integral for merchant center listings. It's integral for uh, featured snippets. It's integral. It, it, having structured data is integral to having um, much more engaging, a much more engaging web and search presence. And you can't have... I mean, you, you need to have your structured data in, in the JavaScript version of the website, but you also need to have the structured data in the response HTML version of the website. Cause, yeah, so it has to be in the raw. Yeah, it has to be in the raw because yeah. Google doesn't want to download all that JavaScript, unpack all that JavaScript, read all that JavaScript, and then figure out what the structured data was. It should just be fed to it. And yeah, so if you think don't... about like Merchant That's... Center, Really think about Merchant Center. Um, they, they don't. They don't have the bandwidth to unpack all that JavaScript. They just don't. And they don't do it well. It still has problems with JavaScript. So if you have, um, there's certain items that have to be in your raw HTML, your response HTML, and your um, schema is one of them. Like your canonical is one of them. Your schema is one of them. Title, things like that. So mm -hmm. definitely make sure that you're not using JavaScript to render your schema. Now, SEO is working on headless sites. If you get the response HTML right, um, it will carry so much weight for you. Uh, you'll be you'll be amazed at 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 how Google suddenly loves you. So strongly, strongly advise. Um, yes. Just like I would strongly advise working on Reddit, <laughs> toxic environment sometimes. <laughs> But it's also an environment that is growing so fast, and not just because of Google, but Google is is like helping in the biggest way. Well, it is up thirty nine percent in traffic because Google raised it. They're using the hidden gems algorithm. They raised it to the little block at the top of the page where there's there's Reddit and Quora. Now this week, some people have done some looking and said that it has declined a little for Reddit, but it hasn't. This hasn't changed. It's just adding more diversity what they're pulling up but reddit's still killing it so yeah i've told you know i don't know how long it's gonna last but you might use reddit you know for a little extra visibility if you're using it properly well i mean reddit in reddit, reddit, reddit in and of reddit itself um <laughs> I, I ask 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 the great digital marketer brescasaurus um reddit in and of itself drives a crap ton of traffic it's just that google is now driving a crap ton of traffic to reddit because it's yeah. pulling up as it's christine mentioned it's using the hidden gems algorithm to pull up content from the depths of reddit that you you know i bet you many redditors forgot they wrote this like eight years ago um unfortunately the hidden gems algorithm is also bringing up uh, delectable items like using uh, non-toxic glue to hold the cheese on pizza um, or rocks to, um, I forget why you were supposed to eat I, rocks. I think it was for gallstones. Diet. I forget why you should eat rocks, but you it shouldn't. It nutrients to your diet. And then drinking your own urine for kidney stones. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So that, that also came from the depths of Reddit. So, you know, when you people always ask or those little supplements underneath uh, search results, you often see that they're from the, they're, they're, they got the little uh, 
little uh, Reddit alien beside them. Um, but you know what? Reddit is one of the websites I open first thing in the morning. I don't need to go to Google to go there. I've been doing this for, for years, and it's because Reddit consistently delivers an interesting experience. It does. It's not. I try to stay awake because I wind up in a rabbit hole I would never get out of. Well, but... yeah, that's true. <laughs> the, 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 the other thing about Reddit it doesn't have those damn little videos that drive me crazy. Okay, we only got a couple minutes left before we got to, we got to jump to two, the interview. Two quick ones. Um, we got two quick ones to go. Yep, go, go, so go. We, we can do. Uh, one, being webmaster tools. Apparently, when you're using big webmaster tools, which everyone should, by the way, because it gives you lots of really good information and very specific, like these 10 pages have too little content on them. Go check them out. A lot more than Google Search Console gives you. Um, but apparently, uh, you can have a 300% CTR on something, click through rate, CTR. Uh, and that is because if someone clicks on it multiple times, they count that. So um, so you can have over 100%. You can go way over 100% if somebody like clicked your thing like 10 times, 20 times. Yeah. So just so you know. So if you're seeing over 100%, it's not you, it's not Bing, it's how it's designed. Yeah, that's that, that's actually how Webmaster Tools is checking or or or, or recording the actual clicks. Yeah. Okay, so SEOs, have you been thinking that you're being marginalized and like pushed out of business? Apparently, you're not. Christine. Yes. Good well, news. Yeah. <laughs> Some good news. Uh, on when I have to say when you know AI content first rolled out. Uh, it was pretty dismal there, especially for the people in other countries who were closing up shop pretty quickly. But now we see that 82.5% of the marketers studied in an night visibility study, um, 200 marketing experts are going to spend more on SEO in 2024, and they're going to prioritize content. So maybe the rollout two months ago scared a lot of people. I'm guessing. I'm just guessing. I don't know that's a fact, but I'm guessing. So um, survey respondents rated content quality and user experience as the most important perceived factors for search rankings, highlighting the need for high quality user centric content. Which incidentally are the two basic arms of SEO. Yeah. Basically. So yeah. Um, there we go. Yes. And then 68% um, of marketers don't feel threatened by machine learning and AI in this study. And in the last year, it was very different. I don't remember the numbers, but it was much higher that people were worried about it. I'm feeling a lot more chill myself. Even I don't think just because of the failures of the LLM. So, well, okay. Now, before we all sit back and rest on our rolls, we got to remember Google had a spectacular, the most spectacularly bad couple months I've yes. ever seen a major corporation have. I mean, yeah. this was worse than um, <laughs> Tylenol when uh, <laughs> when uh, when 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 poison was found in their pills back in the eighties. <laughs> I can't. So Exxon the, might have had a worse month when when the Valdez went down, <laughs> but uh, beyond that, Enron might month. have had a worse month when they went down. But beyond that, Google had a crappy month in May. Yes, it really did. And from its rollout to its issues with errors in the uh, LLM, you know, the AI overviews and the so many issues, so many things, such a short time. Um. <laughs> And then the overall, like I said, the overall feeling behind these models is not necessarily being long term. So, so at the co collision conference, AI was pretty much the sub focus of everything. There was it was, it was hard to find a presentation that didn't touch on AI in one way or another. And one of the presentations that I uh, that I especially wanted to uh, to see was done by uh, the CEO of, of search engine u.com. Now I've been using u.com for a couple of years. I remember when uh, when u.com first hit the scene uh, several uh, several years ago I was uh, I was intensely interested mostly because it was a brand new search engine. But it's not just a brand new search engine. It was a brand new search engine developed by a really interesting fellow, Richard Socher. And I've been following this guy's career for a little while. Um, he uh, he achieved his PhD 10 years ago from Stanford University and has been one of the top writers on natural language processing ever since. Um, he was the chief scientist at Salesforce. 
Uh, before that, he was the CEO of an AI startup called Metamind, which was acquired by Salesforce in 2016. He has received more awards than you could uh, than you could think of. Um, Yahoo Key Scientific Challenges Award in 2011, um, Distinguished Application Paper Award at the International Conference on Machine Learning in 2011, and uh, the Best Stanford CS PhD Thesis Award in 2014. Currently, he's the CEO at U.com, and he spoke at Perplexity on generative AI being the future of search. It was a uh, after after the uh, his his uh, thirty minute incredibly interesting lecture. Uh, Richard and I spent twenty minutes uh, in a in a quiet alley in the quietest alleyway we could find in a sea of forty thousand people. And that interview is coming up, like, right now. Hi, this is Jim Hedger from Webmaster Radio, DLMR.fm. I'm at the Collision Conference in Toronto. I'm with Richard Socher. I'm with Richard Socher, CEO of U.com. U.com is an AI-powered search engine. You've heard about it before on this show. First time we've actually had Richard on. Welcome to Ecology. Thanks for having me. So, what's in, in a 15-second elevator pitch, what's U.com? U.com uh, is the first search engine that moved to become an answer engine and just uses large language models to give you answers summarized from the web. And now we're moving more and more into what we call a productivity engine, uh, a place where we can do many queries for you and then give you pretty complex answers and make you more productive in your work or your studies. Okay, so why is a summarization engine? Basically, right now, U.com summarizes a number of inputs, gives you a... Uh, uh, synopsis of, of what it read. Why are, why are um, summarization or productivity engines the future of search? Because ultimately, that's what people are trying to do when they search, uh, often. Not always, right? And what we kind of thought about is where can we be 10x better than a Google? And the truth is that there are some very simple questions with very short answers, like how old is Obama? Or just like in less than a second, here's Sage. You can't really be 10x better than Google for those kinds of questions. But where you can be 10x better is in questions that require you to do many different Google queries, uh, where you know you say, oh, I'm about to go into a meeting with this company. Now I want to know all their senior executives, give me a summary on their latest AI announcements because I'm trying to sell them an AI product. Uh, if they're public, like look at their stock price to know if they're like currently flying high or like deep down, like not doing so hot. And, and so on. And then you just say, that is my input. Now, just like our productivity engine will do all of this searching for you. No one wants to search. Most people just want to find answers, right? And actually, uh, you have productive knowledge work be done for them so they can then go ahead and be overall more productive in their job. And so that's that's why we're, we're moving into that space. You say that U.com will do five, 10 X number of searches while from my one my one input query yeah how does that happen and how does u.com know which searches to point so it's actually a fairly complicated ai sometimes people think oh it's just like i can just take web results from some serp api and then i can uh just wrap that with gpd3 or something in some api but it's actually fairly complicated to know when to search the web or not then how to cite sources correctly because you may have a bunch of uh, different websites that either mention the same fact but worded slightly differently or actually contradict each other and then you need to decide how you actually cite all of those sources or whether you include the contradictions in your answers and say hey your opinions differ for the same especially when it comes to like touchy political subjects right you don't want to include a bunch of bias based on your search results and then not include a different political opinion uh, on, on a complex uh, subject uh, then you need to dynamically engineer your prompt. Like maybe in the prompt, you should say, I should be citing sources. Maybe I should not be citing sources. Then uh, you need to maybe choose a different LLM. For instance, oftentimes in uh, OpenAI is really good, but sometimes in Tropics, plot is actually better when it comes to instance for to legal questions. And so there are basically a dozen such modules like citation logic and so on, um, query rewriting too. Like imagine you have a longer conversation. And now, like three questions later, you ask, when did, when were they founded? Now, if you just say, when were they founded? You send that to your search backend, nothing useful will come out. Actually, no 
have to understand based on the last conversation. Which, which you all know, remembers. Exactly, which we all remember. And we do this query writing for you. So there are all these different modules that you only appreciate after you realize like this is not going to work with a proper web connection and the LM unless you do all of this hard work. Uh, and so that, that's what we've been doing now for over a year and a half. In the last couple of weeks when I've been experimenting and playing with you.com, I noticed that you um, have multiple, I've, 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 seven or eight different um, LLMs that, LLM models that the user can choose from. How does the user know the best one for them? Uh, does you.com help help me know that one and that Anthropic might or Claude might produce a better legal answer than say chat 40? Yeah, so for the most part in our uh, in our modes, smart mode, which is the D free default mode for stay free, uh, and our research modes and others, uh, we choose the right LM. But then we also offer more the expert users who really want to play around with the latest models, the early adopters. Um, we allow them to just directly choose the model, but oftentimes, you know, we bring out these models the day they are out, and no one yet knows really where they shine and where they're not better. Uh, and it's just actually part of the community that kind of tells us, oh, I'm loving this model for that. And then we kind of learn and see what works well for them, uh, where they give good answers that get a thumbs up, and then we can kind of uh, improve our orchestration layer. With uh, several different LLMs to choose from, or LLM models to choose from, um, that suggests that U.com doesn't actually do its own training, rather it um, relies on, on other LLMs. Is, is that an accurate statement, or does, does U.com do its own training? We do also fine-tune uh, and actually use in smart mode sometimes our own fine-tuning model too, uh, but for the most part, uh, we do not train like massive foundational models. We only fine-tune on top of open source. So when you say fine-tune, is that like introducing different filters to help um, massage the right answer or provide the right answer? Um, it's more just like adding a little bit of training data that is particular to our domain in our space. It did. How long does U.com remember its relationship with me? It's actually uh, there's sort of uh, a big step, which is we have and we're the first to launch a functioning uh, personalization feature. It's one of the many modules of making these work. And if you say like, I have three kids or I love hiking, then it will actually save that to, to your own profile. And then there's another module that basically determines when to use that personalization fact or not. Uh, and so it's also very transparent. You can turn this personalization on and off. You can also turn on and off whether it learns about you based on your conversations and you have full access. You can see in your personalization profile under settings uh, what you, you know, what it saved about you in just natural language. Uh, and so that way, uh, if it's once it's stored in that, then it will actually be much more useful. For instance, if you say, like, I'm going to be in Hawaii, what should I do? And it's like, well, if you love hiking, here are like the best hiking paths, right? And and so, but it, it's also a non-trivial thing because you would think, oh, just in the prompt, you tell the, the ILM model, like, use this when you ever useful. But then we found that he blast fresh is like, who's the French president? And then it would say, oh, the president of the French Hiking Association, you this and that. Sure, like, ah, oh, wait, that's not, like, that's not right. And so it's actually non-trivial uh, to get personalization right. And it's one of those many things where you think, and you can very quickly hack up a prototype nowadays, but to actually make it scalable for millions of users and not screw up is, is pretty tricky. In just a few weeks, the answer to the question, who is the British prime minister, or who is the French president might well be very different. How accurate and how quick is U.com to pick up on, on new information if it's training from LLMs that might be is, uh, is up to date? In theory, every two to three minutes or five minutes. Okay. So because, and this is a sort of fun, foundational, fundamental flaw of LLMs, you can't train them every five minutes, right? Some new like, bunch of stuff happens in the world. You can't just feed that into an LLM right away. You have to give the LLM access to tools and tools are really exciting it's something we're exploring right now too we haven't really made any major announcements but like it'll be mind-blowing once you could see what we have internally in terms of like allowing these ai models to use tools like uh searching that's sort of the most obvious tools but there are lots of other tools out there that that lms could learn to use 
Well, we're actually walking towards my next question. Does U.com employ the, what was the U.com organic search engine um, to produce more, more or they, Yes, we do. Like you have to, and this is kind of the big difference between us and some of the competitors that only launched after ChatGPT came out. They don't have search knowledge and search background, right? And how to actually rank uh, and index and so on things accurately is a pretty non-trivial bit of the stack. There is a pretty big company that has a hell of a lot of search knowledge, <laughs> but has had a disastrous AI rollout. Yeah. Now, in the last uh, couple of years, especially last year and a half, um, since, since uh, the November surprise with ChatGPT, you've been pushing um, AI in the search sector against an 800-pound gorilla that's been pushing what turns out to be mostly hype. How has that affected the way you market U.com? I mean, Jobo had such a disastrous month of May. How has that affected the way you market generative AI experiences? You know, I actually, I started my talks often when I have slides. I start showing all the mishaps of like, and you know, it's not just Google, like, you know, suggesting people eat stones uh, or put glue in their pizza and stuff like that. It's also Microsoft working with like the city of New York and recommending people discriminate uh, like tenants. Uh, it's also companies using uh, AI for, you know, their flight uh, chatbots, uh, you know, airliners and stuff. And then uh, giving out free coupon codes that don't exist and then being actually legally liable. Well, yeah, they said so. To actually have to give them. And so in each of these cases, I just take those quest took those questions uh, and I put them into you.com and it just works. And I'm like, man, we just need to do more marketing. Like our technology is still, despite all of these massive companies, it is more accurate. And I think what, one of the reasons we're now moving into enterprise like uh, and, and site licenses to for employees as well as our APIs um, is that the companies that actually do the AB comparison, they usually say, oh, we want to work with you. Uh, and that, that's why, why we're so excited. Nobody can guarantee accuracy. Like that's the, the Google cannot guarantee accuracy. But it feels you can come pretty close, especially with page rank and citations, etc. How does U.com come as close as it can to guarantee accuracy? Yeah, it's a combination of two of our stacks. One is the search stack, which we reinvented with LMs in mind. You know, Google spent 20 years building the most amazing search retrieval index so that people can choose which of 10 blue links to click and looking at the snippets below the link. Right now, LMs can look at much longer and more snippets for each page. They don't have to just be restricted to such a short snippet that people see below Google links. And so our LM index uh, has these longer, more useful and more overall per page snippets. Um, and so that is a big part of where accuracy comes from. And we actually have uh, a blog post uh, on blog, blog at you.com where you can see um, see the results and the difference in, in accuracy based on a different index. And then the second thing is that uh, it's this whole LM orchestration layer, uh, like the citation logic, um, then like dynamic prompt engineering, the query rewriting so that you can trigger well a, a search stack. All of those things have led us to have higher accuracy. And I think on some level, it just boils down to like caring about that as a company. I feel like it was a little bit too early to hype, but now that we have, like, we know that we're over twice as accurate on some independent benchmarks um, than, for instance, ChatGPT4, uh, now we feel good about really going out there and doing more hard. Um I only have a couple more questions, and I really, really appreciate your time. I'm sure you're pressed for time. Um, when, when people get involved in a search engine, they... This is their information source. They want a long-term relationship that they can trust. So it's going to be around for a while. Fine. Now, you're almost in the position of being what Ask.com was a few years ago with uh, with Google and Bing and, and Yahoo, where Ask was doing a lot of innovating. Ask.com was the first to come up with transit in, in mapping systems, with pipe in mapping systems, with a number of um, question and answer features that, that Google adopted later. Mm. They all watched the little guy who was nimble and able to, to, to innovate and stuff and then copied them afterwards. Ask.com didn't have a very strong revenue model in the long run, and it suffered for it, even though it was technically 
superior to its rivals. Mm. Does U.com got a uh, revenue model that will keep it sustainable 10 years from now? We think we do. Uh, you know, it's, we're going to monetize each element of uh, what we see sort of as a funnel. Uh, we have free users. They will have advertisements in the future. Uh, we have some first A-B tests already running with ads. They're looking quite promising. Uh, we believe that there is a larger and larger segment of users that is willing to pay for things. Well, obviously, that's like 80, 90 percent of people will never pay for search. They're used to having it for free. But 5 percent of search users paying 20 bucks a month or 15 dollars, they get an annual subscription to com. Like, it's a significant number of people and will be a very happy company uh, already. But where I think becomes even more interesting is that we've started to close now what we call enterprise site licenses, where a company can get uh, access to all the employees to U.com and all our premium notes with highly accurate answers. It will do more and more productive work for them. Uh, and then we kind of chew off parts of the Google query uh, volume that in a very specific way, almost more like Amazon competed with Google rather than Yahoo or DuckDuckGo competing with Google. Yeah. Like Amazon competes with Google because there are certain sets of queries in Amazon's case, like things that you can just purchase for less than like 20 bucks or something where you might just search directly on Amazon because like why search on Google and then go to Amazon and search again and like so on when you can just like directly execute on the intent that you have when you make that search. And that is, I think, how um, we can also take some of the search engine market. Yeah. The, um, I guess my last question for you is kind of a dual question. Um, when people relate to search engines, there's two things they relate to. Um, the first, the input interface, and then the search results pages. Right now, U.com has the incredibly sparse uh, it, uh, input. Um, it basically has a question box at the bottom. It, I think it says, uh, ask me a question or something along those lines. Um, and a couple, a couple boxes to choose, choose options from the top. Is that interface going to last longer? And what is the future of the search results page? What does it look like for being uh, five years from now? Uh, that, that's an impossible answer. A year from now. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have iterated uh, quite a bit. Uh, and what's interesting actually is before ChatGPT came out, and the vast majority of our users, when we when we innovated in the design of UI UX of the uh, chat engine results page, CERT um, rather than CERT, um, uh, were saying, like, oh, I'm so used to Google, I don't like it when it's too different. The color of the links needs to be the same, like, it needs to be a vertical list, not a horizontal list, like, all of these things, like, and uh, it's was very interesting to see how that changed when chatting PQ. All of a sudden, people could imagine a new type of interface. And so we're iterating right now, actually, that probably a few weeks we'll have a new interface coming out where the web links are a little bit coming back, but in a different way. They're going to be living next to the chat interface. Um, and, and so, yeah, we continue to you know run A-B tests, ask that, talk to our users, hear their feedback on Twitter and our Discord channels and so on. Uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll continue to, to innovate in that space. Right now, we actually, by default, don't show the list of links on the right, but you can click a button in the top right that will just show you a Google-like list of blue links. So we do have that, but it's by default not activated now, and most people don't click on it to change that default. Okay. Last question. Is there a feature of the beyond the LLM? So large language models are essentially just very useful sequence models uh, that predict the next token during their training phase, and they can generalize in surprisingly interesting ways and sometimes fail to generalize in other interesting ways as well. And so uh, at a high level, neural sequence models will continue to actually wow people across different modalities. Music will come up, you know, music's tempered a little bit by copyright and slowed down in innovation, but that will happen more. Uh, we will see it. Uh, that in video sequences coming out and doing interesting things. We will see this in genetic sequences. We'll see it in proteins um, that, you know, basically govern everything in the human body. Imagine you could write a, you know, uh, a protein that says, oh, I want you to um, attach only to brain cancer cells uh, and write me new proteins for that. And then you connect that protein to a carbon nanotube 
has an iron molecule on the other side. Put yourself in the little magnetic field so they spin around. You have nanosurgery on every cell level. Like now, if you have control over the language, quote unquote, of proteins, the way we have the control now over the language of you in fight English, it will change all of medicine in the future. So I think a lot of interesting things that could be broadly construed as large language models are still to come out. I mentioned tool use also. So I don't, I, I think there's a lot more juice in here and people who think, oh, it's over now just aren't creative enough. Richard, CEO of you.com. Thank you so much for spending time on Web College today. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great chatting. And that was Richard Socher, the CEO of U.com. Uh, got to speak to him for about 20 minutes after his lecture at the, the Collision Conference in uh, June 2024 in Toronto. Uh, and I'm afraid, Christine, that said that it's an incredibly interesting week. We've gone uh, full, full clock. Um, I just had 20 minutes with an intensely interesting person. Uh, any last words that, that, that you want? Uh, no, I just hope everybody has a great weekend and keeps themselves cool because most of the United States is baking. Uh, well, There's lots of water. Much of southern Canada, too. We are under a heat dome. It feels like you're walking into a sauna outside. So, yeah, uh, stay hydrated, stay well. Um, uh, uh, stay out of there, stay cool as much as you possibly can. Be well, rank well, and on behalf of Christine Schackager from Sites Without Walls, this is Jim Hedger from Digital Always Media. You've been listening to Webcology, recorded live to podcast on Thursday, the 20th of June, 2024. Special thanks to uh, Ricky and Brasco in the studio and Darren and Brandy in the office. And uh, this week, um, as well as a uh, special thanks to our sponsor, Audience Key, I want to send special thanks to the organizers of the uh, Web Summit and Collision Conference it was a privilege to work with you guys. Um, thank you so much for, for the privilege of access. And I wish you the best luck in uh, Vancouver in uh, 2025. I know I'm going to be there, and I recommend anyone listening, if you can get there, you should as well. I'm going. <laughs> in the meantime, on behalf of Christine Schackinger, this is Jim Hedger. We'll talk to you next week. Hi, everybody.